Thank you. Welcome all to table and specifically welcome to this celebrative event marking the formal launch of table. So my name is Sigrid wertem Heck, and I'm one of the strategic directors of table representing Wageningen. And of course, I welcome you on behalf of all my table colleagues. Some of them you will meet this afternoon and others you might have already met online or you will potentially meet them in the future. And that's what Table is about. It's a global and predominantly online platform facilitating discussions about the future of our food systems. And I think the relevance of this online platform for continued debate has been demonstrated in these times, had this pandemic, these times of major disruptions. We are remaining internationally connected. And I think it is really grateful and it's really great also to see so many people enthusiastic about the launch of table we had over 700 registrants and i have no clue how many are currently online with us but um, it has been a joy to receive all these enthusiastic registrations now table is about debate and the core of this celebrative event, uh, event actually revolves around the theme that we have been exploring over the past couple of months it's a conversation about scale in our food system. And mostly around the question, should the future of, of food be global or local? Now, before we continue um, with this interesting question and this interesting debate and discussion, let me walk you briefly through the program for this afternoon. So we will start with an introduction about table and what we do. This will be done by our table director, Tara Garnett. And then we then we move from actually talking about table to demonstrating what table is all about. And this will be done by a moderated conversation um, between Pat Mooney and Charles Cotfrey. Now, originally we had scheduled Miriam Romanian, the co-chair of IPAS Food, to be present today. Unfortunately, she is ill. Luckily, it's um, related to COVID vaccination, so there will be short-lived illness, I, I, I believe. Um, but we are very grateful that Pat, uh, the IPAS colleague and IPAS uh, food uh, um, panel member, will step in and um, he will continue the debate with Charles Godfrey, the director of the Oxford Martin School. After this conversation, we will follow with a Q&A session. And this is open to all of you as an audience. And also we will provide reflections uh, from several people within the table community on the discussions between Charles and Pat. At the end of the afternoon, we will hand over the floor to three representatives from the founding universities of Table, Oxford University, Wageningen University and Research in the Netherlands, and the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. Please also do note that after the event, um, we will launch an informal networking and discussion session which is open to all of you that are interested. So please uh, keep an eye out also on the chat box. I believe it's a separate uh, link. Anyway, further information will follow, but please join us in this network event. You're really, really, really welcome there. And we invite all of you. Now, and this leads me actually to address some practical um, issues. Um, most importantly, we will allow for ongoing discussion. So the chat function, uh, within our Zoom meeting will remain open. So please feel free to use the chat for discussion and uh, write in the chat your questions or your commands uh, related to the debate between Charles and Pat. This will be moderated. So in, in case you want to address your command or your, your question to a specific panelist, please also indicate to whom you want to address your question. And that actually leads me to wish you all a very pleasant and inspiring afternoon. I will now hand over to Tara Garnett, our current director of TABLE. So please, Tara, the screen is all yours now. Thank you very much. I'm just going to uh, share my screen, but I need to have uh, permission to share my screen. So could that be enabled? And I will try again. Screen sharing is disabled. Uh, you should be able to now, Tara. Okay, great. Lovely. Um, let me just um, put it on full.
Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, uh, Sigrid, and, and it is wonderful to have uh, so many people here um, uh, on, uh, to mark our formal launch. So um, I'm not the main attraction, it's, uh, it's Pat and uh, Charles, so I will confine my presentation to really just providing an overview of, um, of what we're trying to do with TABLE and why we feel that uh, we're, we're needed. And, and then I will hand over. So when it comes to the why, um, I think this is um, a reflection on the basis of uh, 25 years worth of work within the food systems uh, community. Um, so it's in part, it's a personal personal reflection, but I think, I think there's a lot of commonality with many of you who will be uh, on this call. Um, so when I first started working on food issues uh, back in the 1990s, uh, the discussion was really predominantly about food miles. And this was a phrase uh, that was coined to express disease and discontent about the some of the problems inherent in globalization and, um, and the long distance transportation of food. And over time, um, that discussion became somewhat um, kind of simplified and shortened. Um, and food miles became um, a short term for discussing the climate impact of the food system. But, but over time, uh, a number of uh, studies were emerging uh, back in the early 2000s, which, which came to the conclusion that actually uh, the food system was responsible for uh, greenhouse gas emissions way beyond the transport impacts. And at that time, um, this was quite revelatory to those who were around at that time, but there didn't seem to be a single kind of body that was out there that were an organization that was trying to look at how food contributed to these impacts and what could be done to reduce them. So at that point, um, I set up the Food Climate Research Network, which was at that time based uh, at the University of Surrey um, before moving uh, in 2012 to, to Oxford. But what it was really trying to do was look at how the food system contributes to climate changing emissions and how they could be reduced. But over time, it became, you know, very quickly apparent that firstly, you can't talk about food production without talking about the driver of production, which is, of course, consumption. And you can't talk about either of them uh, and climate change without considering climate within the context of other uh, social, ethical and environmental concerns such as health and animal welfare and livelihoods and biodiversity. So there was a whole explosion of research, including by colleagues at Oxford, Wageningen and the Swedish Agriculture University and way beyond, which was trying to understand these interconnections among these different concerns and try and figure out what could be done to actually reduce these impacts. And, and again, as the debate and the discussions emerged, it became more focused on transformation, how you change, how and who's responsible and what they ought to do and how they ought to do it. And this started to bring in ideas about power and justice and responsibility. And, and so that's that, in my view, has been the evolution of thinking about food and sustainability. So we're now in a situation where, you know, everyone wants a sustainable food system but people's analyses of what the problems are and of what constitutes a solution often are very very divergent and i think this leads to um a lot of um polarization in discussions not helped by social media and it's and it's ilk um and a lot of talking at cross purposes so this is where this is where table comes in um we feel that a lot of the discussions about food uh, these days is, is about the science, but not just about the science. Um, scientific knowledge, as far as we, you know, our foundational principle is that scientific knowledge is necessary, but in it of itself, it's not enough because it can't tell us what a good food system is and what a good way to live is. And I think those are where values come in, which are foundationally important. They shape our visions of good. They drive disagreements. And I think when we talk about food, we don't really talk about what we're really talking about when we talk about food. We don't talk about those values that underpin them. And I think um, 
we also have perhaps um, quite um, sort of simplistic ideas of what, uh, what, what, what the difference is between values and knowledge. And I think they blur a lot of the time. So I think we need to listen to and understand different perspectives. And we need to do this in a critical way, but also in a constructive way. So we need to kind of navigate that space between a kind of uh, anything goes relativism on the one hand, and a very uh, reductive understanding of what knowledge and expertise is on the other. So that's where table comes in. We're not, you know, we're not claiming that we're going to save the world or or kind of change the game, but we really feel that there needs to be an entity, and this is where we step in, that tries to look in more detail at these values and at these starting points and how and why people um use evidence to um to advocate for a particular particular position so who are we we are three universities of Wageningen, the swedish university of agricultural sciences and at oxford and we are a, a small but growing team um, and most importantly we bring with us our networks the old food climate research network network but also those of our new uh, collaborating institutions and we very much hope to expand this in the future through collaborations both formal with other institutions but also and equally importantly with informal collaborations shared events shared activities with hopefully many of you who are on this on this call what do we do um, very simply put, we do two things. We, we provide analysis, clarity and synthesis. So what we're trying to do is help, help people under, understand and explore uh, important concepts and contested concerns that, uh, that kind of are used a lot or that drive debates around food. So ideas about things like food sovereignty or regenerative agriculture or eco-modernism or the idea of we need to work with nature and to explore why people argue for these concepts, what the central debates are around them. And we try and do this in a kind of unbiased and, um, and, and impartial way so that people have clarity, not just about the concepts, but about the parameters of uh, disagreements. We do lots of other things there as well in terms of providing a research library and a and a, a newsletter and so forth but the other really important and of course interconnected aspect of what we want to do is we want to act as a platform for dialogue and communication um uh, Sigrid highlighted uh, our kind of online function and we will soon be launching uh, a platform that will helpfully will hopefully enable people to come together to just discuss and debate across sectors, geographies, and, and, um, and, and disciplines, um, as well as, of course, across a different worldviews. So we, there's an online platform, uh, events and workshops, and maybe one day uh, physical events, but um, we, we all live in hope there. So we, we, have, we have a range of activities planned, and, um, and the best way of finding out about them is, of course, to check out our, our website, and I'll provide the links at the end of this talk. So, so in summary, um, the food space is crowded. There's lots and lots of really, really useful people, organizations doing lots of really, really useful things. Our role, as far as we see it, is, is to act as a, as a bridge. If, if a table can be a bridge, it's to be a bridge that links uh, research on the one hand uh, uh, across the, the disciplines and, and practice um, on the other, and to try and foster more uh, constructive uh, exchange of, of ideas and opinions. Um, so we're going to be taking a theme and keeping with it for a period of a few months. And our first theme is scale, which sounds a little bit arcane, but when you think about it, discussions about what the right scale is for the food system, um, it's, a, it's a very useful organizing principle um, which encapsulates many of the debates 
around uh, the future of food. So when we think about the right scale, we're talking about uh, the scale of movement and exchange. So this speaks to discussions about uh, globalization. You know, on the one hand, globalization offers openness and economic opportunity for all, and perhaps ecological comparative advantage. And there's a counter debate which says that it's about the rich exploiting the poor. It's about food miles and a cultural homogenization. So that's one set of debates that, that link to scale in the food system. Then there's ideas about production and provisioning. So, um, so it's about um, the scale of farming, small scale versus large scale, the concentration of power in the supply chain, the role of corporations. Are these good or are they bad? Again, people will have different views there. What is the appropriate scale of governance? How decentralized should it be? Who should the actors be? What is the role of the individual, that most small scale of self-governance? Again, a set of debates there. And then finally, um, the scale of moral concern. Who do we care about? Do we care about people close to hand in our own communities, in our own countries? Or do we extend that concern to people further afield or across species to, to the non-human world? So I think all these um, questions uh, inform a great many debates um, around the future of food. And to illustrate that, um, um, this, is where, this is where our speakers come in, uh, Charles Godfrey and uh, Pat Mooney, who has really, really nobly stepped in in Mariam's place. And um, I'm going to hand over to them um, but first, um, I'm going to hand over to Matthew, who's going to be facilitating the conversation and who will be formally introducing our speakers. So that's it from me. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Tara. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, depending on where you're calling in or watching from. I'm going to start with some very short introductions, since our conversation will be a better way of getting to know our speakers. So Professor Sir Charles Godfrey is the director of the Oxford Barton School and the co-director of the cross-disciplinary welcome-funded LEAP project or Livestock Environment and People. He's interested in how global food systems will need to change and adapt to the challenges facing humanity in the 21st century and also the relationships between food production, ecosystem services, and biodiversity. And Pat Mooney is a co-founder and executive director of the ETC Group and a panelist at the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems, also known as IPES Food. He's, he is the lead author of the 2021 report, A Long Food Movement, and Pat has worked within international civil society for more than 50 years and is the, and, and is the author and co, or co-author of several books on the politics of seeds, agrobiodiversity, biopiracy, and geoengineering. Pat received the Right Livelihood Award in 1995 for his work defending peasants and their seeds. And as Tara said, we're interested in highlighting how each of you differently envision the future and how you came to that view. We're all on the same side with we want a sustainable and just food system, but we really want to probe how do we get there. And there are major differences in people's uses of those two terms, what is sustainable and what is just. So I'll be introducing a few different topics to explore several important areas related to scale in the food systems. So we'll look at biodiversity, technology, digitization, but we'll only be scratching the surface because there's so much more to explore. And as a moderator, I'm planning to introduce these topics and then occasionally ask some follow-up questions. And as we're practicing dialogue, I'd like to mostly offer the floor for both of you to go back and forth to discuss and respond directly to each other's claims. So we'll start with something like an opening statement from each of you. So 30 years ago, in 1990, we were more than 15 years away from smartphones, and global trade and the organic and local farming movement look very different than they do today. So we'd like to start this conversation by asking you to each describe your vision of what you'd like the food system to look like in 2050, 30 years from now. We'd also like to know how your intellectual background and your life experiences inform this vision. And we'll start with Charles, and we ask you to be as specific as possible in describing the year 2050. What are on people's plates? How are people shopping? What do farming landscapes look like? What does trade look like? How globalized and localized is this food future? Charles, please go ahead. Thank you, Matthew. And it's a, a pleasure to be part of this uh, event. 
I guess when I look at the Global Food System 2050, what I would like to see is, first of all, a global food system that feeds a population that's going to be somewhere between uh, 9 and 10 billion people, and which will contain people who are wealthier than they are today. And that's a good thing. People should come out of poverty and they're important feedbacks on population growth. And I think to do that, it is inevitable that we will need a globalized food system. And I, I'm very uh, taken by the uh, comment of the economist Joseph Stieglitz, who said, we live in a globalized world, get over it. The real challenge is to make globalization work work in particular for the environment and work for the poor people, the people who do not, do not have uh, a voice. So I think we will have a globalized food system. I think we'll have a food system where, which will just have to be sustainable. So what I would like to see by 2050 is however you farm, whether you're farming uh, sort of high technology farms or you're farming uh, very low intensity, it must be sustainable. It must have, it, it must add up with carbon emissions as well. So I would envisage the food system being very much a patchwork where you have some, uh, some areas which are farmed pretty intensively. You'll have some areas which are farmed at low intensity. And we will probably um, retreat from farm areas because we will need it for other areas. We will need it to sequester carbon. It makes no sense whatsoever to farm on some of our peat rich soils at the moment. So, so that's what I hope it'd look like. Um, if we are, and I'm an optimist, if we are to make the global food system work, we need action on all fronts. And that includes, um, and that includes uh, diets. So I would hope that by the middle of the century, we, especially in the rich world, are eating a spectrum of food which has a much smaller environmental footprint. And I think that will involve eating less, um, less meat and dairy. Uh, and then the other thing I hope we do is that we spend much more attention on uh, people whose, at the moment, income depend on agriculture in the global south. Uh, among low income countries. And there I think the real challenge is to bring these people out of poverty, to give them a good life. And some of that will be by remaining on the farm, but some of it will remain, will be by people moving off the farm. And I hope that that transition, which uh, I think will have to happen in the global south, will happen in a socially just way, unlike what happened in most of, uh, of Europe, where we threw people off the land and uh, many people emigrated to Pat's continent. We don't have another continent where that can happen. So it's an enormous question, Matthew. One could talk about it for ages, but let me stop there. Thanks, Charles. And the same question to you, Pat, what would you like the food system to look like in 2050? And how does your own background and experiences bring you to this vision? Thanks, Matthew. And, and again, uh, congratulations to the table for uh, putting this together and, and uh, this, uh, this kind of launch. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, uh, the bad news is that uh, I agree with Charles. Uh, not a good way to begin a debate. The, uh, that's the kind of world I would like to see. That's what I would hope we might have in 2050. I might nuance a few things a bit differently here and there. Uh, uh, I think I'm, uh, the question really, I think, is not what I would like to see so much as what will we see. And I, I'm afraid that uh, given uh, the, the crises around climate, uh, the crises around biodiversity loss, uh, the challenges of geopolitics these days, the, the kinds of levels of, of corporate manipulation of the economy that we have these days, this can be very hard to achieve that. Um, I would I think we should all do our best to achieve what Charles is, is, is envisioning, but, but it's not going to be easy. And so realistically, I believe that we'll, we can get to a world uh, by 2050, which is surviving uh, all these crises and, and can see its way to better, a better time ahead, but it'll be, we'll go, we're going to go through some very rough decades uh, coming up and we're in them now. Um, getting there, I think we'll have to try a diversity of strategies. I think that, that um, we are going to, what, 
develop I, what I believe will have to be a, a kind of a wide tech approach to how we change our systems in terms of the technologies at least, where we have much more inclusive strategies for, for technology introductions and assessments in the future. I think we're going to need to have a, a sort of a with a global system, yes, but a decentralized global system in that there'll be multiple, multiple centers of, of action and change, which is will be a distinct difference from the way the world is today, where it's becoming ever more centralized in terms of who controls and who makes decisions. Um, we need to have diversification in the sense of uh, if we're going to get through climate change and biodiversity loss, where, where production will depend heavily upon a much, much wider range of crops and livestock and fish species, marine species to keep us alive. We'll need to have a system of much greater exchange of experiences between what I would describe as about 350 million laboratories around the world, which are the farms and fisheries of, of, of small producers around the world, exchanging their information with one another as to what works with climate change, what pests and diseases must be encountered and overcome, how best to do it them working together with the scientific community, the so-called traditional scientific community uh, to do that, um, but struggling to, to, to meet what are going to be very tough times ahead. We're going to need to then develop more territorial markets. That doesn't mean we exclude the rest of the world, but uh, it would be silly for communities around the world not to try to be as food self-sufficient as is possible under their conditions and their situation uh, to, to survive. To, to survive these challenges. And we're going to, of course, need to change our lifestyles, and that's happening already, uh, whether it's in China or it's in Canada. Uh, people are adjusting their, their consumption patterns that will have to continue to be adjusted. We can't live and consume at the same level of meat and dairy products as we do today. We need to develop that. To get to that point, we also then need to look at where the problems are, where the opposition is coming from. And I do believe it's coming strongly from our economic system, coming strongly from agribusiness. We can't get to a more diversified and safer world, not totally safe world, but a safer world, unless we control uh, agribusiness uh, power in, 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 uh, of, of the economy. Uh, we need to break up major multinational corporations in the food system. We, they can't continue as they are. We need to also have a system of technology assessment, which is a people-based technology assessment based on sound science, but based upon participatory dialogue among all those concerned by the science and technologies. And um, it, we, we need, so there has to be that level of assessment at the local and even at the international level. We'll need to look at new treaties and structures to get us to those places over time and, and uh, again, have a more disciplined view of how we, we uh, uh, share our world with one another. Uh, um, we can't simply have, have uh, we, uh, scales have to be uh, scales of justice as well. Um, how do we scale up to that? Frankly, uh, it is, is going to be a struggle for us. I'd simply say, and I'll end with this, that the last uh, 70 years or so of agribusiness control of the food system, the industrial food chain has shown us that they can't scale up. The industry hasn't been able to scale up beyond feeding about 30% of the world's population with any remote level of adequacy. So I'll mm. end it with that. Thank you, Pat. And it seems that we both agree on this, on this shared vision. And what we want to explore is how to get there and where there are maybe differences, because you laid out a bit of an approach there and we'll hear what Charles uh, has to say about some of those. And one way to dive into this topic is the exploring this, the relation uh, of scale and the role of farming systems in impacting both on-farm agrobiodiversity and off-farm biodiversity. So as you mentioned, Pat, the, the food system has radically changed in the last 70 years and it's had these very large impacts on biodiversity. We've, we've You've both mentioned that we want to increase the diversity of crops and livestock, and and at this at this moment, what we have achieved is that we're proving we're producing calories more efficiently and affordably than ever than ever before. But this has had its impacts on biodiversity. So it's a topic that you both care about. You've had a lot of background in, and I'd like to explore. But you but you also come at this from different angles. So starting with Charles, I'd like to uh, ask you. What role do you see agriculture playing in reducing biodiversity loss? And do you find that either different farm sizes or longer short supply changes favor either biodiversity or agrobiodiversity differently? 
So the way I approach this as someone who sort of spent most of his career in biodiversity science um, is we really do need to make room for nature. So there are certain ecosystems uh, which we just need. You cannot maintain the richness of life on Earth purely on the highly altered landscapes that humans have created. And similarly, we have to maintain the carbon stocks in our tropical rainforests and things such as, uh, as that. So I think one component of the, um, of the um, agricultural system has to be to produce enough food that we do not um, convert more land uh, into agriculture. And in fact, we take land out of uh, uh, agriculture. Within the ag agricultural um, footprint, then I think all land has to be, um, be farmed sustainable, even the most high intensity land. And that, mean, and that means the components of biodiversity that provide direct services to agriculture such as the soil microorganisms, one needs to spend a hugely more attention into maintaining them at the moment um, so that uh, they provide services to agriculture free and we don't need to substitute them with artificial fertilizers and things. Um, given that so much of the world is agricultural land, a lot of biodiversity is maintained on agricultural land. So again, going back to something I was talking about earlier about the mosaic of mixtures of high intensity, low intensity, and semi-natural habitats, then those semi-natural, uh, those um, low intensity agriculture will maintain a lot of, of biodiversity as well. So I think it's too simplistic to think about it as land sharing versus land sparing. Uh, it's much more of a spectrum. Yes, we do need to make room for that part of biodiversity and that part of carbon storage that cannot coexist with, with agriculture. But then within the agricultural footprint, one needs to have sustainability everywhere and then a context specific spectrum of, uh, of um, agricultural intensity that in some areas will allow rich biodiversity, in some areas will allow less biodiversity, although there will always be the essential biodiversity, for example, in the soil, some pollination, some natural pest management. And uh, your response to that, Pat? Well, this is going to be frustrating. I, again, I agree with Charles that that's absolutely the case. We have to look at what's blocking uh, that vision from taking place now. Uh, how do we move towards it without uh, also uh, uh, encumbering uh, those peoples who are on land now that may be shifting over time? Uh, so that means, I believe, uh, looking at, for example, forestry and, con and conserving forests and savannas and, and uh, parklands in my part of the world. And it, it means uh, recognizing that there is a great deal of, of gathering still going on in, in all of these areas that needs still to be encouraged. The, the best preserved uh, lands in the world today are those that are preserved by indigenous peoples who still use the land. So we need to, to develop, I'm sure Charles would agree with this, and we, we still need to make sure that the systems we put in place uh, protect that. Is it, the, the forests are an important food source for people still, and, and there is no conflict necessarily between that and, and, and preserving diversity. We also need to look at the, the major problem we're faced with now of land grabs around the world where sovereign trusts and, and, and corporations are grabbing large chunks of land, sometimes not even using the land at all uh, or using it for, for export crops only and not being concerned about the needs of, of local peoples. We can't have a world where land is controlled that way. It has to be land that's, that's uh, uh, guided, governed by uh, the local peoples under the, in, in a national context. So we need to develop systems that allow that. But it, it's, it's, it's doable. I think it's, we can get to that place. We also will have to look at uh, some decentralization from cities, I think. We're, we're seeing that already where I live and, and I'm sure in the UK as well, that a slight movement away from cities now because of new technologies making that more possible and pandemics making it more necessary. But we'll, that trend, I think, will to some degree continue. We'll have a flow of some people moving into cities and others moving away from cities, and we need to be sympathetic to, the, to those needs. Thanks, Pat. Matthew, um, I, I'm conscious that Tara was very keen that we try and disagree with yeah. each other. And so, yeah, <laughs> so, we agree with each other so, so this is this is what I plan to do right now, which is I'm trying to well, dig I, into I, some... some we need to pick a fight I, somehow here. Yes. I wonder if I could ask Pat a question. Uh, and it, 
it's, it's something that, that you said in your, in your first suggestion. And so I'm going to be devil's advocate here. And you talked about the importance, importance of um, self-sufficiency. So my devil's advocate position, um, isn't that a red herring if one wants a well-functioning uh, global food system? And I guess I put myself in the position of the uh, prime minister or, fo or food minister in a country such as Egypt. Uh, a population of 90 million people will double in the next uh, 50 or 60 years. With the best will in the world, Egypt is only going to be able to uh, feed a small fraction of its population from the land in the delta and a few oases and things like that. And um, surely what we need is a global food system that can meet the demands of a country such as Egypt. And if we encourage too much self-sufficiency, and not saying that local agriculture isn't important, but the sort of narrative of self-sufficiency might actually get in the way of, a fit, of an efficient global food system that can then leave, um, well, produces good livelihoods for farmers and allows some land to be spared for carbon sequestration and biodiversity. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, uh, it's not a, uh, either a ones and zeros option here or a black and white option here. It, it's uh, self-sufficiency. I think we should be as self-sufficient as we are able to be and not more so. And, and there'll, there'll be many people in many parts of the world who simply cannot be self-sufficient for all kinds of reasons. They're in the middle of, of uh, Shanghai or they're, they're uh, 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 caught in, an, again, an environment such as in parts of Egypt where they simply ca cannot be in, under those conditions. And, and we have to address that. Um, but I think we should agree that, that there should be as much self-sufficiency as is viably possible for our planet. And a, that can be a lot more than there is today. And in order to ensure that we get that level of self-sufficiency, we've got to break away the barriers that prevent it. And we've got to stop subsidizing an industrial food chain, which makes it very hard to do that, which makes cheap food available, subsidized by governments uh, and by poor people in the world. Uh, there's $750 billion per year that's in agricultural subsidies, most of which is goes to the wrong people in the wrong places. We need to apply those kinds of resources to encourage the self-sufficiency and, and to, to, to uh, make sure the industrial food chain does what it can do best where it can do it well and not encroach, encroach upon the interests and concerns and, and needs of, of poor people around the world. Mm -hmm. So, so, so let me try and push back a bit. And I'm a biologist, not an economist, but I'm going to pretend to be an economist. Uh, with, well, with any of my hats, I completely agree with you about the perverse subsidies, which uh, are damaging to the global food system and to sustainability. But an economist would say, uh, actually, the degree of subsidy that a country should uh, should go for is determined by its competitive advantage in producing food or not producing food. So one should expect, say, some of the countries in South America with relatively poor populations, large agricultural lands, to really concentrate on food and other countries to concentrate on, on uh, other activities. So, so, so I'm parroting a sort of simplistic Ricardo view of, uh, of the world. But do you see... Um, any argument for that? Well, we're both getting older. If we can both remember comparative advantage as being a key <laughs> economic argument, I think. Um, I don't think it is. I, th I think that there's a recognition now that, that uh, uh, there are certain fundamental needs where comparative advantage doesn't really work. Um, it's simply in unacceptable that in large parts of the world, they can't produce their own vaccines uh, and can't get access to them because comparative advantage would now argue that, well, we can produce them all in India or in Brazil or in the United States or in Germany. Uh, that capacity for production has to be in multiple places. The same way with something as vital as our food system, uh, comparative logic dictates in a world of, of rapid climate change, which is uncontrollable and unknowable as to how it's going to work and with other pandemics possibly down the road, we can't presume to think that a long supply chain is a safe way to, to survive. Uh, so no, I don't agree with that. I do think we have to uh, try to again, have as much self-sufficiency as is viable and possible in, in at local levels and territorial markets. Yeah. And so I think that's a good reply that the, uh, the political economy in some sense trumps the 
the straight the, uh, the, the straight economics. I suspect we probably do disagree a little bit on that spectrum about where one will put ca comparative advantage versus self sufficiency, but probably not that much. Yeah, and how do you <laughs> how do you view Charles the the role of corporations in transforming the the food system, and what what role do you see them in the future? Because it seems that Pat has a a bit of a stronger stance in that there should be a more decentralized structure uh, that government should have some more power in kind of dictating the rules and then the role of transnational corporations in some sense has trumped these more democratic efforts. Uh, curious to hear what you have to say or reflect. Gee, on I was that. trying to hide my bias there. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let me say where I agree with Pat and then try and, and well, at least raise a question. So uh, I'm appalled by some of the lobbying one sees in the uh, private sector. Uh, I am appalled by the way that um, they can, you, you can get regulatory capture and um, unfair taxation and things like that. So I, I think there's some really negatives um, about the structure of multinational corporations at the moment. I, I, I guess I am slightly uh, hopeful by some of the things that are coming out of the o, OECD, the Biden administration, that we might be moving in the right direction, but I think these are, are baby steps. Um, I do think that the, and Pat probably wouldn't argue with this, I, I do think that the private sector is an absolutely critical part of producing the, um, the uh, an efficient and fair global food system, and I don't believe the arguments that food is too important to be left to part of the private sector. Um, if you look at some of the um, big commodity companies, the Cargills, the Archers, the, the Bungies, and we have the global commodity um, system dominated by a relatively small number of, of companies, some Chinese ones coming in. Um, and uh, these are also private companies, so we know less about them than if, if they were publicly listed companies. Um, now, they do their job at the moment pretty well, and I guess I'm agnostic about how, um, about the arguments about breaking them up. I guess what I really would want to see is a sort of stress testing that we wish we'd done to the banks about 2000s. I'd like to see that stress testing being applied to the big commodity companies. Were they to come through that, then I would be relaxed. Were they not to come through it, I'd be really worried. I, think I would, I would uh, argue that, that the, as I said before, that the industrial food chain hasn't managed to scale up over the last several decades and, and they aren't, they even know where the poor people are, where hungry people are in the world, much less how to how to feed them or, or support them. But I'd also say that the, it's sort of an industry that seems to suffer from, uh, I should have to call it late onset dementia. It doesn't seem to know where it's been. Um, I recall the, the president of Coca-Cola uh, speaking to bankers in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, saying that we're in the midst of a revolution here, everything is changing in our system, we've got to move quickly to adjust to these changes, to recognize the environment that we live in, and he meant the, the world, the, the, both the social and, and the, and the uh, ecological environment, uh, and we've got to do it fast. But he said that in 1970. Mm -hmm. And Coke really hasn't changed uh, in all the decades since then. Um, we constantly see the companies telling us that they're going to do this, they're going to do that, they're going to cut back on plastics, they're going to cut back on, on waste, they're going to do all, they're going to cut back on fertilizer. They haven't actually achieved any of those things. And every time I open up another issue of the Financial Times or, or, or The Economist, I read again how uh, greenwashing is a constant theme of these companies and their lobbyists. And they, they just don't do what they say they're going to do. And they don't seem to remember what they promised before and, and haven't delivered. So I would not want to trust them to direct their food system. And I, I wouldn't believe what their promises are. And I'm particularly nervous if they, if they really propose to use the, the marginalized peoples of the world as guinea pigs for technologies which they can't be sure will work well or safely for everybody. They might but they may not and the risk is high, so it has to be managed more carefully. I guess I'd like to, maybe this is provocative, I would like to see some of the technologies that are being proposed and could have potential to be seen as public utilities. 
information technology could be as public utilities, not controlled by companies, but ones which we all have access to, like we used to have access to things like, remember old fashioned days, like when we used to control water in our food, in our, uh, in our, in our cities, and we used to be able to control uh, uh, um, telephones. Uh, I would like to see that kind of capacity in our governments so that new technologies can be introduced in a way which, which are for all of the benefit of all the people and not in the hands of a few companies. So, so thank Charles. you, Charles. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just shift us uh, towards a, another section, but I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to respond to that, too. Um, so we're going we're gonna to focus on technology. It's a really good transition. And I'm, I'm curious, Charles, if you, if you agree with Pat uh, and what he just laid out around technology as a public utility, but also I'd like to ask about specific technologies. What, what would you see as an acceptable solution or as an acceptable technology under what circumstance, um, as in how is it regulated or where is it, uh, where is the technology coming from? Uh, what, yeah, I'm curious about your thoughts on that, about what types of technologies under what conditions you'd like to see in your future food system. And if you could also mention whether or not you think GMs hold a role in that. Well, well Pat, I'll, well, let me first comment on, on what Pat just said. I, I think the concept of um, utilities for some issues around data and, and IT services, I, I think that's really good and something we should think more of. Uh, to respond to your question, Matthew, let, let me start at the end uh, from um, with GM and sort of use it as a sort of portfolio of, of modern te technologies and things. Uh, and I mean, you ask for my life experience, I'm a biologist, so I, this is the world I know very, very well. And, um, and full disclosure, I'm involved in a GM technique, but um, to control mosquitoes that transmit malaria, not a, an actual, actual uh, a food, food system. Um, I guess my view is, first of all, they need to be regulated very carefully and not regulated by our scientists, they need to be regulated from people completely outside us. Um, when it comes to um, GM in agriculture, then I, th I think the, my view is that the overwhelming evidence is that they have relatively benign environmental effects and little effects on, on health. Um, but to me, it's much more of an issue for um, civil society and for the public to, uh, to debate this. So, uh, and to me, some of the really main issues is what does the adoption of these technologies mean to power relationships within agribusiness? And I often feel that some of the arguments around the health effects and the environmental effects are actually uh, surrogate arguments for arguments around power and economics. And my view is that we should have those arguments in the proper domain, which is around power and economics, and come to a conclusion on that. And that is something for us as citizens, not me as the scientist, to sort of really determine. Um, we may as a society decide that we don't want to have um, GM and some of these modern technologies within our portfolio to address uh, some of the food issues ahead. I think that would be a shame if we could get the economics and the power right, because it will mean we will just have to do more heavy lifting on uh, on other areas. Um, as a biodiversity person, I'm dismayed by the quantities of broad spectrum chemicals that we pour into the environment. And um, there are modern technologies that could, could reduce that. So from a biodiversity perspective, I really do see some advantages there. But I do think it's a social and economic question primarily. <laughs> Full disclosure, um, I just had an mRNA vaccine, so I'm compromised. Um, I'm and, sorry and... you didn't have the Oxford one. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might say that. <laughs> and and uh, I remember in 1983 uh, writing a book on a computer and being roundly attacked by friends of mine in Greenpeace for using a computer and how outraged it was that I was bowing to that technology. So uh, uh, I, I, I have to be sympathetic to many of my friends who really have a profound sort of spiritual view of, of uh, some of the new technologies and transformations of biological materials and ownership of life. And, and I share some of that, but, but uh, I 
pretty much agree with what Charles is saying again, that, that the issue is, is, is in significant part a matter of ownership and control of the technologies. Can we trust those who are uh, proposing them, introducing them, and have intellectual property monopoly over them? Um, can we assure ourselves of the direction they're going in? I, I do recall, and this makes me feel old again, that in, in, in 1981, uh, writing that that uh, the, with biotechnology, the interests of companies would be to develop uh, plants that liked their uh, seed varieties, that liked uh, their herbicides. And I remember I was hauled off to Basel to meet with the companies at that time, Siba Geigi and Sandoz in those days, uh, who uh, roundly attacked me for, for uh, even suggesting that herbicide tolerant plant varieties were possible, that it really was almost scientifically impossible to have them. Uh, and of course, what happened in the end was that, that, that uh, if you simply follow the money, you see where they end up and the corporate greed and logic led them to develop herbicide tolerant plant varieties and genetically modified crops. And uh, when those first came out in uh, 20, 30 years ago now, uh, or 25 years ago now, we uh, warned that the logical next step would be to develop plant varieties that weren't uh, transgenic uh, because of the, the opposition to that but were sort of what we call then intragenetic and essentially variations on CRISPR-Cas9 or, or gene editing technologies today, uh, that that would be a logical trend for the companies to pursue that. And again, you can argue for the benefits of that and the risks of that, but the real concern that Charles and I are unfortunately agreeing upon again is, is it, who owns it and who controls it, who gets to have a say in what is safe and what is not and under what conditions. So, so Pat, trying to pick a fight with you, <laughs> Do you think there's an issue that uh, because of the fuss over the GM, then governments have brought in uh, extraordinary levels of regulatory oversight and hoops to go through, which has had the perverse effect that only the very big multinationals can afford to invest in these technologies so that the smaller, smaller companies that might, that might be developing these techniques that could benefit smallholders in Africa um yeah. they're just nowhere there they that uh, they can't be yeah uh Okay, I, we're going to fight then. <laughs> Good. Um, I'd say that's all your fault, Charles. It's it's uh, it's all it's all the fault of the scientific community for uh, hoof and mouth disease and how they handled that in the UK and Europe uh, some decades ago. It's the fault of how a mad cow disease was addressed, which created a great distrust in society as to uh, could they trust science, could they trust regulatory agencies to do their job correctly, and that spilled over then into the introduction of GM crops, um, but. But, but from there, we, we, we probably have more commonality again. It's, it's, um, I, it's uh, one important difference, though, uh, in, in since then, is I don't think it's so much over-regulation by governments, frankly, as it is the desire of companies to exclude opposition. It's very, it's very useful for, for the largest corporations to set up barriers to entry to smaller companies by using government regulation to, to make sure that they're the only ones that can afford to be in the field. And they did that. They argued with governments. And I remember one discussion in the UN in, in the mid 1980s, where companies basically were saying that in the context of the pharmaceutical industry, that, they, that regulation was helpful to them in order to make sure that they had the playing field field to themselves. And I, I, that's, that's been true in this case, the, the UN and I was involved in the negotiations around the Cartagena protocol uh, in the biodiversity convention that led to the to what was thought to be conditions for the export of genetically modified seeds from country to country that actually worked very well in the interests of of the major companies again to exclude the minor players and it was an opportunity for the major companies to basically uh, have the re resources of foreign aid programs to educate so-called scientists in the south to simply be regulators of their technologies rather than to be scientists doing their own research so i, I think often the, techno the, the technologies are uh, use regulation to protect their own interests mm -hmm. I do, so just a, a, a just a keep brief, this a little short, Charles. So yeah, we can, a, uh, move on to the next. A brief one. reply. Sure. I completely agree, agree with you. That led to really great mistrust. It's an irony that the um, mad cow disease. It was a fault of old technology, a fault of bad rendering rather than any modern technology. But I think you're ex exactly right. 
I'm afraid I completely agree with you around uh, some of the issues around IP and the patent jungles that can uh, inhibit uh, innovation. And I think that's something that really does need to be looked at if we, we are to have a much better innovation ecosystem. So I'm going to skip the topic on digitization because I, we're running a little short in time. I'm afraid we would end in a similar area of agreement in terms of not just what the future looks like, but exactly oh, no. who is uh, speaking to it. But we're going to move to knowledge domains and then we perhaps there'll be an audience question on digitization that we can draw from too. So we're at table, we're interested in exploring the evidence and values that people uh, draw from in their own research and work. And as we talked about earlier, our desired visions are based on our own experiences. And here we have three men from the global north discussing these topics, which is also gonna influence the tenor of this conversation. And as much as we- But I'm an accident. Miriam should have done a much better job. <laughs> <laughs> and we're very we're grateful you stepped in at this time. <laughs> um, and we're, as much as we like to aim for these evidence-based conversations, they're also deeply entangled in our own personal values. So we'd like to start uh, here with Pat and you draw help from a lot of different sources to produce your work. Why do you think that's important and how do you negotiate drawing from scientific or academic publications on one hand or lived experiences like uh, different food producers experiences? Uh both are obviously very important. Uh, uh, I'm not an academic. I come to this from uh, my own experiences in civil society. Um, and I got into this quite honestly, in, I remember painfully well in 1963, there was a World Food Congress that was held in, in Washington. I was in high school at the time. And I remember watching on television, President Kennedy in front of the World Food Congress uh, telling everybody, and, and it's been repeated ad, ad nauseum ever since, he said, we have the means, we have the capacity to wipe hunger and poverty from the face of the earth in our lifetime. We need only the will. And as, as the years have gone by, and I found myself in Asia and Africa and Latin America working on these issues, uh, what's very clear is that we, meaning us white guys, um, don't have the means that art that we need, we don't have the capacity that we need, and we certainly don't have the will. And we can't assume that the technologies are going to solve these problems. It, it, it's a social issue. It's, a, it's an issue of food justice, of food sovereignty. And, and uh, I find inspiration uh, in the diversity of, of organizations that I've worked with, whether it's in the Philippines or Ethiopia or Sri Lanka or Bolivia uh, in the world who, who are doing amazing work and, and uh, do know what they need to have and what they want uh, and are not afraid of science. They welcome scientific participation in these issues. Their biggest fear, and I, I'm sorry if I reflect this so much, but it is that, that whenever people talk about let's collaborate together between peasants and, and scientists, Western scientists, uh, it is, it's the next question after they agree to collaborate is uh, the scientists saying, so here's what I want you to do. Here's how you can help me because you can be my cheap labor to do these experiments. And that's not the kind of science or the kind of, of, of dialogue or assessments we need to have in the world to, to get to a better place. So uh, I, I've, I guess I come to it with a bit of a chip on my shoulder that, that I think that the scientific community hasn't learned how to talk and work with and share with uh, indigenous and, and peasant communities around the world or those who are food insecure. And that uh, to, to be able to take advantage of science and technologies as we should, we've got to get over that and create a different kind of structure of communications. And maybe this table is the kind of place where that can happen. Thanks. And I'll ask if uh, Charles uh, just a similar question, if you could answer briefly, um, what, what evidence and values do you, or what evidence and knowledge base do you draw from in your own work? So I come hampered from the fact that I've been a scientist for 35 years. So I'm probably very blinkered in my response to this. Uh, I do think that there is something very special about the scientific method as a way of finding out about the world. And I think the scientific method can find out about things within a certain domain that cannot be done in any other way. Having said that, I really resonate with what Pat said about uh, sort of imperialist scientists going abroad and uh, corralling cheap labor. Uh, my community, and I should say, I'm probably part of the problem as well, needs to be far more um, far more uh, stuff this way we collaborate with people. 
Uh, Co-creation can be used as a um, as a cliche, but when done properly, it's it's really important. I also worry about my community, uh, especially really good scientists who sort of assume the authority of science to go well way beyond the domain of science. And a colleague of mine at Oxford uh, refers to it as crypto adv advocacy. So calling upon the authority of science, but actually advocating a particular policy, uh, policy thing, which involves values and the values are, are hidden there. So I'll defend to the death the uniqueness of the scientific method of a way of finding about uh, nature, but really think that the scientific community needs to be uh, much more open about engaging with a much broader system of knowledge. Can, can I, do I have time just to add a quick thing there? Because I don't very, very quickly, with, please. <laughs> I don't disagree with what Charles said, but I, I, I don't know if it's unique. I've certainly been in communities where, uh, again, peasants are looking at their land and they take a very holistic look at, view of their land. So when they think of making a change, they see how it interacts with everything else uh, that they have to face, including the marketplace. And, and they do it with great rigor, great care, great rigor and great consultation to be assured that the steps they are taking and the step-by-step -step experiments they take to see if this will work for them or not, uh, will actually work and not kill people, not cause starvation in their, in their own community or in their own family. So there's intense rigor around that. There's intense dialogue around that. There's a lot of experimentation. So I'm not so sure it's unique to Western science. Oh, I wouldn't say Western science. And, and I would come back and say, aren't they doing science? And isn't it wrong to equate science with Western science? You're right. It isn't. It is wrong to create it with Western science. And I'm afraid that I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. And I, 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 we've got lots more to talk about around that. But I, <laughs> I don't think most of your colleagues that really share that view or practice that view. So I'm going to have to put a pen in this and we're going to move to audience Q&A because we're already just a little bit behind. And there are at least 35 questions and obviously <laughs> we're not going to be able to get to all them but i flagged a few that have been upvoted uh quite a bit and also r relate to the topic of scale so sophia bokvist and i apologize if i mispronounce your name uh asked it is estimated that about 80 percent of the food produced in low-income countries is produced by smallholders is there a future for smallholder producers in the f in the future and i mm -hmm. I'd like to, I guess, hear both of you respond, but perhaps Charles, if you could uh, reflect first. And I, I think I know Pat's response a little more clearly. So first to Charles. Well, I, I'll answer very briefly, going back to what I said beforehand. Uh, if you care about the livelihoods of a huge number of people in uh, the global South, then you have to think about, uh, uh, about agriculture. Um, I want those people to have uh, good incomes and to come out of poverty. Much of that will involve the continuation of smallholder farming, but not necessarily all of it. So I, I don't put sort of the maintenance of smallholder farmer as the, as the necessary end. I think the end should be sustainable uh, and just development. And I'd be amazed if smallholder farming isn't a major part of that. I know that, that FAO has, has gone as high as suggesting that 80% of, of food in Africa uh, is produced by smallholders. Um, in our own research, uh, we'd say probably two things. One is we, we think it's probably in reality around 70% worldwide, uh, but we'd also say that no one knows for sure. Uh, the, the research hasn't been done in any way that we can feel really confident that we've got those figures right. We, who's a smallholder, how much land and what different under what different conditions can be considered to be a smallholder, how much is produced in urban settings, strictly urban settings, peri-urban settings, how much is gathered in the forests. All of those considerations aren't well taken into consideration. But whether it's good or bad entirely, it, to us, it roughly appears that about 70% of the world's food is, is produced by smallholders in one way or another. And that doesn't mean that everyone's well fed by that. Uh, doesn't mean they don't need more support. They do that with almost no support, with only about 20 or 30% of the resources that, are, that uh, industrial food system uses in terms of water, irrigation systems, and so on. So it's, 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 not, a, a, it's not great that that, that, that figure is, is a solving a problem of any kind. Uh, more has to be done. Yeah. 
And just quickly to plug, we have a podcast conversation coming out with Vincent Ricciardi, who conducted one of these uh, global studies looking at what percentage of the world is produced by small folders. And his number was closer to 30 to 35% among under two hectares. Under five hectares, it was closer to 50%. And like you said, Pat, there are other kind of considerations. And I think this yeah, is- just deal with fisheries or, yeah. fisheries or forestry or urban production. So it's-, it's Yeah, no, this is, I, this is much longer conversation to kind of get into unpacking that evidence because it is deeply- uh, contested. And uh, one more question. Unfortunately, this will be the last uh, audience question. Um, this one is on governance, and I'll leave it open to whoever would like to take it. So Yurun Kanda asks, how to foster collective action towards a more sustainable food system, towards more sustainable food system outcomes in an increasingly multipolar world? What sort of governance regimes do we need? <laughs> Pat, you go first. Thank you, Charles. Um, well, we don't need the kind of food system summit that's being proposed for later this year. It's been developed very tragically by the World Economic Forum more than anybody else and is really almost excluding governmental participation the, the way they're approaching it. We do need to have major changes in our food system. Back in the, in the early 1970s, uh, the uh, United States and a couple of other countries, including my own, kind of blew apart the UN system of food governance, where it was really a rather integrated strategy of science working together with those working in the field, working with uh, the investment structures and the emergency relief structures all together in one thing called the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. That all got blown apart into different institutions, and it's, I think, been pretty dysfunctional ever since that time. We need to have a food system summit that brings that together so there's a harmony and synergy between science and technology that's being done by CGIR, for example, and the kind of, of, of investment work being done by the International Fund for Agricultural Development and the World Food Program with FAO to, to, to make it work better. And we have something that's been created over the last decade called the, the Committee on World Food Security, which is a UN body, which does try to bring these things together. And it seems tragic that the government models now being proposed by industry would actually, again, prevent that from continuing to function in the way that has been effective in the last decade. A couple of very brief points. One is to go back to something Pat said much earlier, that some of the governance system that one sees in indigenous people are really fascinating. And economists such as Al Nostrum have written a lot about that. Mm. There's a lot of lessons there, I think, to, uh, for all of us. Uh, I, um, let me jump to something I would like to see, and we have the COP coming up, the climate COP in Glasgow at the end of the year, um, and I hope that works, but I worry about these very, very large multinational things. I would like to see the rich countries, North America, Canada, EU, Japan, possibly China as well, actually get together and um, work out a way in which they can trade in which carbon emissions are also taking part. And I think that the rich countries beginning to get this going by bilateral or small multilateral things could be a real way of, 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 shaking, of, of shaking things up. So on the governance, that's a specific thing I'd like to see happen. Well, that'd be great. Thank you both very, very much. It ended up being a bit more of a discussion and dialogue than a, a very intense debate. Um, but what we're going to do now, we're just uh, practicing, we'll work on yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have some reflections uh, from different members of our partner institutions, as well as audience reflections, too. So if there's someone, if there's something that uh, someone from the audience would like to say, please raise your hand and we will uh, call on you to share soon. And Pat and Charles, if you could just stick around for a little bit longer, we're going to uh, share these reflections. And then if you have another additional comment, we'll give you another opportunity to do so. So now we invite uh, Edin Lulus, uh, my colleague at Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences and a research director at TABLE. Uh, Ellen researches and teaches about sustainable food production and sustainable land use from many different angles. So Ellen, We'll start with you. What are your general reflections on the conversation? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Pat and Charles, for this really interesting uh, discussion. And um, uh, it was interesting to see that on this kind of high level, there was there were many agreements. Uh, but I'm here today to represent the research community of environmental assessment and modeling, 
So dealing with numbers and trying to put some numbers on uh, the outcomes of different technologies or pathways or, or scenarios for the future. And of course, here it's not enough to say we need to take away some land for, 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 from agriculture or we need to, to, to farm more sustainably. To, to really model this, to put the numbers on it, we need to take this tough decision. So, okay, when we, see, when we say we need to take land out of agriculture, how much land then? Uh, so it, I think it, it's when you get down one level below the more general that it, it, it gets a bit more tricky maybe to, to agree on to what extent we need to, de to do things. And of course, working with future scenarios, it's, it, many of the things that you, you discussed are very relevant. For example, what level of self-sufficiency should we aim for in, in the future? Like I've been working now with, with modeling the European food system, the Swedish food system. Should Europe produce mostly food for its own population? Should we export to the world because we can produce food efficiently here? So the, the, these questions are, are very central to my work. But I would say, I mean, scale in, in general is, is very central to doing environmental assessment because you need to break down the, the complexity and um, studies a part of the food system of course it could be a food item with using life cycle assessment it could be diets it could be studying a farm and then where do you draw the boundaries and when you've drawn the boundaries you also have to consider what happens outside so how does the rest of the world actually develop and that influences um, your results um, from the, 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 the system that you're studying uh, and of course in this work, there's lots of these values coming in, depending on how you draw the boundaries, what indicators you choose to, to include in your work and so on. So I think dialogues like this, um, we need to extend them to also um, include, um, I mean, we, we need to extend the modeling work to include also these discussions about uh, the transparency of of the modeling choices and how to interpret these um, results in light of what 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 choices went into the models uh, from the beginning. Yeah, so that was my very quick reflection and, 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 and thanks again for a really interesting discussion. Thank you, Ellen. And now we invite George Cusworth, a postdoc researcher at the Oxford Martin School and a human geographer working in part with the LEAP project, Livestock Environment and People. Over to you for your reflections, George. Great. Well, well, thank you very, very much, both to Pat and Charles and, and Matthew. Um, yeah, it's been a really interesting conversation. Um, I think over the, the course of the conversation, I think one topic that um, seemed to be wheeled around but never quite got to was the idea of lock-in. Um, and I say lock-in, they're referring to the idea of all the, the different structural inertias that might be locking us into one particular system, even though there might be very, very good reason to want to transition towards another system. And, and you know, the idea has had good application in um, the context of energy provision. So, you know, there's all these sort of health, environmental, economic reasons to want to be making a rapid transition towards renewable energy. But, you know, as the last 20, 30, 40 years have shown that, you know, that transition hasn't taken place. And, and, and that's because of, of lock-in and there's a sort of um, infrastructure um, uh, path dependency. Um, and and it's, it's an idea that clearly has good application in the context of agriculture and food and farming. Um, and particularly thinking about scale, you know, that, that, that's been the organizing concept for, for this conversation here, but also for, for the last few months of tables activities. Um, and, and the combination of, of lock-in and scale feel like a very sort of fruitful and, and generative way for thinking about the problem. So you might <clears throat> um, take the, com the, contact, the concept of um, crop diversification, which is a solution which both Pat and Charles have alluded to, you know, might, you might want to sort of re-complexify the, the crop rotations, increasing the number of different crop types, potentially reintroducing livestock um, into arable, arable rotations. Uh, and it's, you know, clearly it's a great idea and that's all these sort of um, advantages that might come along with it. So, you, you know, reducing the amount of fertilizer, they're reducing the amount of pests. Um, but, you know, think, thinking about the way in which the lock-in is exerting itself uh, and sort of prohibiting that, that transition to a greater crop diversification, you know, thinking about scale, you, you can take the seed, for example. Um, the, the seed bears the imprint of 
research agricultural um, research and development agendas for the last 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. Uh, and it means that, you know, there are certain crop types that are incredibly productive. So, you know, in, in Europe, wheat and barley uh, and certain rye grasses, that means that those crops are really, really productive. So when you want to come in and weigh in and say, well, how about you sort of diversify that crop rotation and use, for example, leguminous crops, then, you know, the, the, the seeds that are available for those farmers to use um, aren't necessarily as, as high yielding. So, you know, that, that lock-in has, um, you know, in the system which we're sort of in, involved with now, it's very, very hard then to transition. So that's, that's the first sort of, the, the smallest possible scale that you might imagine the lock-in exerting itself. You sort of scale up then to the farmer. You know, the farmer has become essentially an expert in the production of a certain very limited number of crops. And then again, so then the injunction to diversify the crop rotations, well then there's all those sort of knowledge economies that they have to sw they swim up upstream against. So, you know, how does the crop rotation work? How does, you know, all of these sorts of things, you scale up from the farmer, then again to, to the farm, you know, there's a sort of infrastructural thing. Um, yeah, so, so I raise the, the yeah. The, then the consumer is another sort of scale at which you might want to think um, about, about lock-in and again, um, has, consumption habits become sort of concentrated in a very small number of crops. Um, you know, what, what does it mean for a farmer to be producing lots of legumes when the consumption of legumes is very small? So yeah, I, I just raised this sort of scaling issue of lock-in as potentially a fruitful way to think about the different barriers that might, you know, prohibit the transition from one, from the system we're currently into the, you know, um, the system that we might want to move towards in, in the future. Um, yeah, thank you very much, George, and and uh, we'll give some, as I said, some opportunity uh, at the end for uh, reflections from the speakers. And lastly, we have Tini Van Buchel, uh, Emeritus Professor in the Department of Agrotechnology and Food Sciences at Bakken University. So Tini, what did you find interesting or was even possibly overlooked in this conversation? Yes, uh, thank you, Matthew, and thank you also, Pat and Charles, for a very inspiring uh, discussion. Uh, there are many things I would like to reflect on, but uh, there's limited time for that. So I, I picked out a few things that I found interesting. I'm a food technologist, so I have my bias, of course. So I would like to pick up a few things that I heard about technology and industrial production. Um, I think especially Pat was quite critical about um, industrial production, uh, that it does not deliver what it, uh, what it promises. And I can see and understand why he makes that statement. Uh, but what I would like to yeah to 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 make a plea for is that that does not discredit uh, technologies as such i mean they are used in a certain economic system uh, called big companies and then it goes maybe in a direction that that is not necessarily going in the right direction but it does not mean that technology is not important even not for for smallholders uh, uh, when you think about food technology as a way to reduce food waste to preserve uh, food to uh, make it more safe, then I think technology st still has a very uh, large role to play, but in a different constellation, perhaps. It should not be uh, not like we did the past uh, 70 or, or even 100 years now. So uh, as, as both of you actually said, I think the problem is not so much with the technology, it's much more in the economic system and the environment in which uh, these companies that use those technologies are operating. Um, so that has to change. Then uh, another thing that um, I would like to draw the attention to is um, that it should be a societal debate. I mean, both of you really uh, indicated that also, I think we, we need to really to connect with society, with citizens, with consumers. And I think that we should really try to involve much more uh, the role of, of citizens in determining how and where our food system should go to and what really bothers me a lot is that politicians do not act here. Uh, and I think they will only start to act when there will be pressure from consumers and citizens to, to do something that goes more in, in the right direction. And also here, since some, one of you mentioned is also inclusion of, uh, of citizens in uh, the type of technologies that we want, in the type of food systems that we actually want is badly needed. Uh, I'm not sure if that is a scientific thing or not. I, mean, I think there's, there's also something like uh, 
uh, science about communication and, 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 and things like that. Uh, but it should be much more than marketing. At this moment, my big problem with food companies is that they do not have a dialogue with consumers, but they only do marketing. They try to find out some niches uh, there and there to, um, to, to, to launch their products. But that should, that should change. They should really interact with, with their consumers about what they really want. And, and finally, uh, uh, something that I also would like to add a little bit is about when we talk about sustainability, uh, of course, everyone will subscribe to that, that it is necessary. But I think we should also think much more in, in terms of sustainable diets uh, rather than sustainability as a big uh, container uh, concept. Uh, so sustainable diets is, means also that we have to change the way that we uh, produce our food in terms of uh, it's not just producing products it's about how these products fit in a diet uh, it's not only about calories it's also about these hidden hunger things where people miss uh, essential nutrients and we really have to think also in that sense much more differently than we are currently doing so that's i leave it here there's much more to say but uh, this was what came to my mind when i listened to the discussion thank you Thank you very much, Tini. And I'll just uh, open the floor for Charles and Pat to give brief reflections uh, on the reflections if you'd like. If not, we can also continue to the audience. But if there's any points that you'd like in particular to respond to. I have a comment, but Charles, you go first. So, so to, I agree with the vast majority of what the speaker said, and I won't just repeat that. Just two comments. One on something Ellen said about the importance about doing the modeling so one actually sees what one has to do. There's been quite a lot, I think, of interesting uh, modeling recently that is really highlighting these difficult choices. Uh, for example, the World Resources Institute, I think, has done a really interesting study on this. And then finally, on, T on Tini's uh, point, about um, making it easier for governments to do things, for politicians to do things. Um, I don't often quote, quote Jean-Claude Juncker, the ex-head uh, of the EU, but he said, and he's exactly right, often we know what to do, we know what we need to do. What we don't know is how to get elected after we've done it. So I think we <laughs> as individual citizens need to make it easier for politicians to make hard choices. I wanted to comment on something George had said, uh, or riff off of it at least, uh, on, on the lock-ins. One of the lock-ins that worries me is, is uh, and this is a mantra that's coming out of the preparations for the Food System Summit this year, is that we have a big tent, uh, we need to accommodate everybody, we can all live together, we can have an intensified agriculture or, or the industrial food chain beside the peasant food web, uh, agroecology in, in the same system. And, and I want to say that's not easy. They're not possible. In fact, the the um, it's a bit like there's the argument that the, the elephant and, and the mouse can sleep in the same bed. Uh, the elephant in this case is the industrial food chain and its power, its, its political power, its economic power is such that it really does crunch it down on, 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 the, on the mouse. And, and uh, it's not possible for, for an ag agroecological food system to be in the next field to um, uh, a totally different industrial food system. And, and we have to be, uh, we can't get too excited about the possibility that we can all live together as one happy family under one umbrella. Thanks. Trying to be provocative desperately at the end here. <laughs> and um, we're going to move to um, some quick audience reflections. So we saw that uh, Lauren Baker had raised her hand earlier. If you can turn your video on, Lauren, and then you can offer your reflections. Thank you. We see you. Thanks, Matthew. And thank you so much, um, Charles, Pat, and Tara for, for convening this conversation. I think um, it's been a really interesting hour plus. Um, just a couple of re reflect quick reflections. Uh, I'd love to hear from others too. Um, I'm I'm really interested in in how we can use a kind of the platform that that you've created at Tables to really explore the different constellation of of ways of knowing and worldviews that we need to inform the future of food. So you know, both uh, Charles and um, and Pat, you've talked about this. Um, but I think it's really fundamental and we really need to kind of push ourselves to um, think about how the sort of global majority 
Um, Pat, you know, how do we involve, you know, different perspectives in, in this conversation? How do we um, bring in Indigenous and traditional worldviews? Um, I think it gets us beyond um, this conversation around scale in an interesting way. Um, I think it helps us expand our idea of diversity um, and connect it to that uh, relational way of being in the world. And I think it helps us um, potentially um, explore in interesting ways. I mean, George, you, you described scale um, in such a in such a creative, interesting way. And then how do we like look at the edges of those scales? How do we um, think about the systemic linkages um, between um, this kind of scales that we're talking about sort of take us beyond uh, this sort of binary thinking that we're trapped in. It's one of our central lock-ins, I think. Um, and just finally, I want to echo um, that uh, kind of centrality of governance. And I was really uh, interested in, in the idea of citizenship that you raised. So this idea of food citizenship that people have been talking about. And again, connecting that back to, you know, who needs to be around the table um, how do we get beyond um, multi-stakeholderism, uh, like Pat, you suggested? Um, how do we uphold multilateralism while really, um, uh, you know, in a genuine way, uh, uh, acknowledging that we need new perspectives um, uh, to be part of this conversation? So thank you very much. And I really look forward to all uh, that will come from uh, this table and this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren. And we have one more audience reflection. Um, okay, nope, sorry, that was a false hand that we just learned in the chat. So what we're gonna do now is move on to the, uh, the next section. Although we have a new hand, uh, Rebecca Lawton, would you like to speak and join the chat and offer a reflection? And please turn your video on if you would like to, and if not, we can move on to the next section. I'm back now if you still have time. Yes, Do you, would you like to share a reflection, Rebecca? <laughs> uh, yes, sorry, my internet's not brilliant today, so I might. Um, <laughs> yes, I just was um, wanting to say that what Pat said just now about the elephant in the mouse really resonated with some research I've just been doing as part of the um, UK ELMS Environmental Land Management Schemes Test and Trial, which is really showing very clearly that the industrial scale supply system is really driving a lot of the environmentally detrimental factors, uh, practices in horticulture. And there seems to me to be a real disconnect between industrial scale supply systems and small scale diverse seasonal production. And I can't really see any way that the kind of more ecological systems that we need can be supported while we're still seeing the industrial supply system as the dominant way that people get their food. And we really do need to be moving to much shorter supply chains that have more of a focus on the farmer, the farmer getting a fair percentage of the price. So I think that um, we really need to be looking at the scale issue and about industrial scale and small scale and the qualities that each of these bring in as an urgent part of this whole discussion. That's what I needed to say. Yeah. Thank you very much for giving me the chance. Thank you, Rebecca. And uh, Pat or Charles, are there any, any last uh, reflections? Pat, you go first. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I did want to come back to what Lauren's saying because it, it, it's a really important point that there is this this pervasive discussion now about multi-stakeholderism, uh, not just at the summit level but everywhere, and and it sounds so reasonable. Uh, so why let's all get around the table and just reason together somehow, not recognizing the power balances that exist around the table. And what it really usually comes down to is that the corporations want to talk to the governments and make a deal uh, because they're the ones with the resources and 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 the, and the army. And, and um, the, they bring in civil society as sort of store-bought civil society to be at the table as well to make it look nice and democratic, but the real negotiations between governments and corporations. And, and we have to recognize in these discussions that, that in, in, in that process that, that, that uh, there are stakeholders and there are 
uh, stake eaters, basically. The, the civil society or, or the peasant organizations and those who are food insecure are real stakeholders. Uh, the corporations at the table really are, are just worried about their, their year-end bonuses. And it's not their lives that are at stake and they're the stake eaters. And we've got to be very cautious when, when that language is used and we sort of marginalize the real kind of negotiation and participation that, that we need to have in the world uh, uh, where governments still finally have to make a decision at the end of the day. So I'm all for small food chains where possible. And I agree completely about um, the outsized overweening influence of large sections of the, um, of the food industry. Uh, nevertheless, I do think the food industry is part of the solution. I would like to see it reformed, not done away with. And in the chat, Arthur Hansen makes, makes a nice point. Perhaps the elephant and the other smaller animal may not be able to share the same bed, but they both inhabit the same uh, forest. So um, I would like to see a more respectful relationship between the elephant and the mouse. <laughs> Thank you both very much. And I'm going to now pass it back over to Sufid Vertemhek, who introduced the beginning, and she will take over the proceedings from now on. So thank you again to Pat and Charles. And Pat, you're welcome to turn off your uh, video if you'd like at this point. <laughs> sure, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. I think Matthew was still talking while being muted. I hope you can hear me now. Uh, thank you all. And uh, I really hope you got a good taste of what table is about and how we, how we try actually to foster these ongoing debates on the future. And also I think it demonstrated clearly the difficult choices we are confronted with, but also how to harness all these different perspectives um, within these debates. So, and actually to conclude um, this event, um, I can only do that by re-inviting you, by joining Table uh, beyond this event. Um, meet us online, meet us offline, meet us through email, to chat platforms, wherever. But um, I will leave the words of support to three representatives from uh, the founding institutions. Um, we will start with a representative from Wageningen University, then we move on to the University of the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, and we close up with a note of support from the Oxford University. So I would like to invite Inge Wallage as representative of Wageningen University first to the screen. And uh, Inge is the director of corporate communications and marketing in uh, Wageningen. She has a lot of experience in stakeholder engagement in a variety of working environments. Um, so for instance, she worked also on change strategies for businesses and for NGOs. And until September last year, she was also the director of the European Association of Communication Directors. So she brings in uh, a wealth also of experience in communications, which we much welcome in uh, within table. But Inge, please, um, the floor is yours or the screen is yours, so to say. Thank you, Sigrid. And thank you, Sigrid and Tara and everyone else for this launch and for a very interesting dialogue, debate, conversation, because I think it was a variety of a few things. Um, the strategic plan for Wageningen University and research is called Finding Answers Together. And I don't think it's for nothing that it is actually called Finding Answers Together, because we're convinced that it is about the togetherness call it multi-stakeholder, call it working with your different stakeholders. Many versions have been mentioned before, but it is crucial to go for the next steps. And as part of that, we have started a while back to build a community that is concerned about how to deal with dialogue and how to work with dialogue. So it's very close to the heart of um, our organization. And therefore, uh, obviously, we are very supportive and enthusiastic with the initiative of TABLE. I think the challenges that we will find, which were addressed by many of you, is what does it mean to actually find one another in a dialogue? What is the values that we're all um, basing our opinions on? What is the language that we use? And then I don't necessarily mean the language, although I also mean that the language from one scientist to the other, but between the scientist groups and indeed other groups, the people that are not the scientists, as have been mentioned by some of you in the reflections. 
the art of listening in that respect, not to, li to listen superficially, but to listen deeply is a particular skill. And it's something that we need to train on well in order to find one another in a dialogue. And then last but not least, I think one of the things, and it's been referred to also, is that polarized world in which we find ourselves. And in order to avoid that, can we see the invitation when there's resistance? Can we see the invitation when there's conflict? I think that will be a, a fantastic invitation for table to see what uh, can be done in terms of finding the many different uh, stakeholders, finding the resistance and how to deal with it. I think we're extremely lucky that we are digitally connected and we can do this um, in an online form. I very much look forward to finding new forms uh, in different places where we can actually work together. We are building a building on our campus at uh, Wageningen that is really focused on dialogue where we can explore different forms that will bring people together. So overall, um, full support, looking forward to the next steps and very enthusiastic that we're part of this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Inge. It's really lovely to hear. Um, and of course, it's not only Wageningen, it's also the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, as mentioned before. And I'm actually wondering whether we have in our audience uh, Ilva Hilbor. Um, she is um, the, yeah, the Pro Vice Chancellor for International Relations of um, uh, SLU. But Ilva was out for getting a vaccination. So I hope she's just in time to speak a word of support. And otherwise, may I ask Ellen to join the screen with me? Oh, yes. Ellen is there. Yes, I think unfortunately Ulva is not back yet. So we have another COVID related uh, absence today, unfortunately. But uh, she's written uh, a little text for me to read. So I'll just read that out. And this is, you have to imagine that this is now Ulva, Ulva's words. Wonderful. Um, Thank you. Okay, so the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, SLU, conducts education, research and environmental monitoring and assessment in collaboration with university partners from all over the world, as well as with local and regional partners from different sectors in society. Scientific approach, creativity, openness and responsibility are fundamental values that describe the starting point for all SLU's activities and for our contacts with the world. Table as a platform ticks all of those boxes. In a novel and creative way, you provide an arena for an open and dynamic dialogue around the food system. One of the key areas for sustainable global development. You stimulate, facilitate and moderate the conversation around complex issues open to different perspectives and views. You also strive to steer away from polarization by taking the responsibility to provide science-based explainers, those you can find on our webpage, related to all aspects of food uh, from production to consumption. In this space, the trade-offs and goal conflicts related to sustainable development, to Agenda 2030 and the Global Development Goals, the SDGs, become apparent, even acute. On a general, almost theoretical level, we often talk about trade-offs and goal conflicts and our contribution as university as honest brokers for the multi-stakeholder and interdisciplinary collaboration uh, that is necessary for finding sustainable solutions to the global challenges. Table adds a dimension to this work by exploring the space and the tension where science meet context-dependent views and politics. I think it's nicely illustrated by the building blocks you provide based on scientific knowledge and that you in blog posts and podcasts highlight how personal views, experiences and context and political agendas affect how we put these blocks together, which discourse we build and which decisions we make as individuals and as societies. Clearly, Table is an important, important platform and partnership for SLU. It gives us an opportunity to share experiences and learn about these issues in collaboration with our colleagues at Oxford and Wageningen and others who engage in table. And I hope that we through this platform will be able to expand and intensify the dialogue conversations and interactions with actors and stakeholders from across society, 
especially focusing on students and the youth as they will have a key role to play for the development of a sustainable food system in the future. From Ilva Hilborn, Pro Vice Chancellor of SLU. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen, for reading out this message from Ilva. And uh, luckily we are yeah, gradually opening up with more and more people getting vaccinated. So uh, hopefully we can next time meet also uh, in uh, yeah, on-site events. But of course, we can't close off this event with some last words, uh, important words from Charles Godfrey. Uh, please, Charles, you have been with us already as our keynote, um, which we very much appreciated, but you have been a strong supporter from table from the start. And it's my pleasure and honor um, yeah, to introduce you for your final words of um, support to table. So again, Charles, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Sigrid. I have a feeling you've heard far too much from me already, so I'm gonna be very brief. Um, about eight or nine years ago, we set up an Oxford the Future of Food program, and we are lucky enough to persuade Tara to come and join us. And so we hosted, uh, we have hosted FCRN for a number of years. And not only has FCRN done a wonderful job, but Tara herself has just done a great job within the university, bringing people together, asking hard questions. And this philosophy I see very much within table. And uh, I'm hugely looking forward to what it can do uh, ahead. I have to say, sort of speaking with an Oxford hat on, it is just great to be in part of a coalition with SLU and Wageningen. I've been to both universities, they're fabulous universities. We can learn a lot from you, and I hope that uh, we'll be able to reciprocate in some way. So let me just stress, I think TABO is a wonderful initiative. It has our very strongest support and more power to you. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, I would now actually give the last word to um, our director, who has been mentioned many times before, is actually kickstarting this whole development. Please, Tara, it's all now up to you. And thank you for everything you've done uh, till date. Thank you. So it just remains for me to uh, thank our speakers and um, to um, Asked you all. I've I've just come back online actually because my internet has has let me down uh, to the latter part of these proceedings. So um, sorry about that. But um, this is just just a big thank you to uh, Pat and Charles and to all our contributors and and our speakers. Um, best way to find out about Table is just to go online and follow these links. Um, so I'm going to close the the formal event, but. Um, my um, colleague uh, Helen is going to, we have a networking, an informal networking session afterwards, after this session formally closes. So um, look at the chat box and you'll see um, that there's a link for a separate Zoom. Um, and so just copy that link or click on it now and, and it will start two minutes after this closes. We also have um, a feedback form and we'd be really, really grateful if you'd um, if you'd fill it in, because we we want to you know find out how we can do better, what, what you know, and and all the rest of it. So please um, please do fill in the link. So um, I hope to see you in a different Zoom in two minutes time. But for now, from me and um, from my colleagues, thank you very much and um, goodbye. <laughs>